And that's that's the great shuck and jive. It's like the privately owned Fed. It's privately owned when it comes to profits. But when it comes to things going south, yeah, you think they're going to pick up the tab? Wake up. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, in a conversation that is being recorded on the 6th of April, 2020. And today we have a treat for you, a new guest to the Corbett Report, but someone I would hope you're already familiar with, um, but I fear that you're not, because although he should have millions of subscribers and perhaps billions of views for his video videos, he does not. Uh, we are talking to John Titus of Best Evidence, a criminally undersubscribed and underviewed channel, but let's uh, get the Corbett Report community to change that uh, to the extent that we can. I'm going to obviously put the links to his channel and his videos in uh, the show notes for this video. Please go and check it out. I cannot recommend his work strongly enough. It revolves broadly around the issues of central banking and the bank heist that took place in 2008, where money comes from, other such related subjects. So I know it will be of interest to a large section of the Corbett Report community. John Titus, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, James. You're too kind. Not at all. And I think once people do check out your work, they will see why I have such high praise for it. Obviously, a lot of research and a lot of effort goes into your videos, and I can only complain that they don't come out nearly often enough. <laughs> but <laughs> I understand that good work takes time, so I do appreciate that. And uh, we're going to start today's conversation. We're going to drill down on your latest video, which is the first episode of the second season of a episodic uh, playlist you're working on called Mafiocracy Now. And uh, again, please go and re-watch that, that whole first season that you did. It was extremely, very important information and well-detailed. But now we're into the second season and it's revolving around such issues as why is the Federal Reserve lying about coronavirus? And this story picks up on March 15th of 2020, a.k.a. the Ides of March. And of course, we all know the famous injunction from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar to beware the Ides of March. Uh, but perhaps that injunction has never been so applicable since 44 BC, when Julius Caesar was assassinated, as it was on March 15th of 2020, when the Federal Reserve issued a press release, the uh, a statement from the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, that starts by noting that the coronavirus outbreak has harmed communities and disrupted economic activity in many countries, including the United States. You don't say. Uh, as a result of which, blah, 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 yada, 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 the Federal Reserve is prepared to use its full range of tools to support the flow of credit to households and businesses and well, how are they going to do that? They're going to increase holdings of treasury securities by at least $500 billion and holdings of agency mortgage-backed securities by at least $200 billion. And yes, if you go and check the uh, the balance sheet, which you can do at FRED, the Federal Reserve Economic Data website maintained by the St. Louis Federal Reserve, you can find that in the past month, the Federal Reserve has increased its balance sheet but to the tune of $1.6 trillion or so absolutely staggering amounts of money are being thrown around right now, um, but in what way and to benefit whom? So let's drill down on some of this data, which you do present in your latest video. Uh, if you have not watched that video yet, please stop our conversation and go watch it. But having said that, John, explain to us what is the Federal Reserve lying about coronavirus for? Well, you just read it in the March 15th memo. They come out and say Main Street's got a big problem called coronavirus, we're here to ease conditions on Main Street. That's absurd. The Federal Reserve adds to its balance sheet. It adds reserves to its balance sheet. It does not add bank money to its balance sheet. Let's take a step back. There are two monetary circuits in this country. There's the circuit that you and I and our viewers use, which is the bank money circuit, meaning the money originates from bank loans, commercial bank loans, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo. They create money that circulates in our regular, normal you know, Joe Sixpack, ordinary American economy. That's one circuit. There's another circuit of money called reserves, okay? And that is used by the central bank. Central bank manages it, meaning the Federal Reserve, and the people who its customers, for lack of a better term, are commercial banks, the same banks that I just listed, plus other central banks, plus the U.S. government. But the point is that central bank reserves – 
that one circuit, that money does not mix with bank, commercial bank money, or the regular bank money circuit. So the notion that the Federal Reserve is going to come out and pad its balance sheet in order to help Main Street is ab- it's, it's absurd. It's grotesquely uh, absurd. Not only that, but recently, and I did not get into this in the video, the reserve requirement has been dispensed with. There is no more reserve requirement. So in the old days, until recently, a bank wanting to make a $1,000 loan had to have $100 in reserves. That, that, that is no longer the case. So you can't even argue that, well, they need to add the bank reserves now in order to be able to ease credit conditions and by issuing bank money. That's not even true anymore. So this whole thing is in its cover story, and that, that is what the video is about. And in that video, you detail that very well, including a clip of Bill Dudley, the former Federal Reserve of New York uh, governor or or president, who um, admits on air on Bloomberg in January of this year that, yes, the the repo response, the the injection that the Federal Reserve started making in September of last year was not fueling the stock market. And precisely for the reasons that you outline there, that there's this dual circuit and the, the reserve money does not mix with the bank money. So... That really does uh, underline the fact that, yes, they are absolutely lying about the fact that this coronavirus response is designed to help households and businesses. That is demonstrably not the case, and from the mouth of the former president of the Federal Reserve of New York himself. But there's another aspect to the lie, which is to say that this is what's happening right now is solely the result of the coronavirus disruption. We also know that is a part of this lie. How do we know that? The reason we know that is that the Federal Reserve began padding its balance sheet again back in September of 2019, so just a few months ago. Remember that between, say, the beginning of 2018 and September of 2019, the Fed was trimming its balance sheet. It was engaged in what's called tightening. And so the balance sheet was gradually reducing until September. And then in September, there was a big problem in the repo market, repo not meaning repossession, but meaning repurchase agreement market, which is a market where people go for overnight loans. And if they're not, I call them loans, they're not really loans, they're structured so that somebody comes in, they actually sell an asset. So, and and then for money, and then they use that money and then pay it back with a little bit of interest the next day. So it would be like me coming in, selling the title to my house, for say $250,000 and then getting that money and then in the morning paying back $250,000 and $100, something like that. That's the repo market. Trouble there started back in September when suddenly rates, the repo rates, the interest rates popped up to 10%, not 10% overnight, but 10% annualized. And a lot of that had to do with JP Morgan withdrawing from the repo market, withdrawing its reserves from from that market trimming its reserves, using other things. and But that, that market, the Fed then stepped in in September and went gangbusters. I mean, they was making huge loans to the tune when you add them all up. And I know there's a, sort of an accounting problem. You can't just add up the loans since they are just 24-hour loans. But it was trillions of dollars. I mean, it was you know hundreds of billions of dollars of sloshing around in that market. And nobody really knew what was going on. The only guy who seemed to have a clue was a guy from Credit Suisse a Hungarian guy named Zoltan Pozar. And he suggested, well, you know, he actually foresaw this coming, and but nobody nobody really pinned it down um, the way that a lot of bloggers in 2008 were sort of on to problems with the Fed, problems with the commercial banking system back then. And a lot of people were blogging about it. So you could sort of look behind the curtain if you knew where to look. In September 2019, there were very few people who were really – uh, on top of what was going on in the repo market. And to this day, I don't think anybody really knows what happened there. There's a lot more opacity now, the, the absence of transparency, than there was 10 years ago. So anyway, the problems with the Federal Reserve and the banking system did not just begin with the coronavirus. That's ludicrous. Uh, it certainly is. And you raise... Uh, I mean, there are so many different issues that are happening right now, and it is somewhat staggering to me that they're getting very little attention uh, overall in the story. But I, of course, it makes sense given all of the other fireworks that are happening right now. But regardless of whatever virus or whatever is happening or not happening on the health front and all of that, this is something 
tectonic that is happening at the root of the core of the global monetary system right now, uh, of course, overseen by the Federal Reserve and mighty King Dollar, uh, to the tune of trillions upon trillions of dollars, as you say, they're removing the reserve requirements. Uh, trillions of dollars are being put into all sorts of new special um, purpose vehicles that are being created. Uh, no one has any clue what's going on, really. I mean, uh, the only people who really know what's going on are the people who are working on these deals. So I guess I have the impossible question for you. Why? What exactly are they doing and why are they doing it? I know you can't exactly answer that, but uh, give us well, a sense let me give of you what's a, going on. A couple of roadmark, a couple of indicators along the road that something is very, very amiss. One is what you just mentioned, the special purpose vehicle. Very dodgy legally. They started in 2008, I think, with, with Lehman Brothers. But those are, because there are two circuits, um, the one way around the Fed adding bank money to the system, as I understand it, is special purpose vehicles. It's, it's kind of like a dark slush fund where reserve money goes in and bank money comes out um, of dubious legality. Um, that's one problem. Another indicator is the huge coronavirus bill that just went through. And there's big problems there. Now, you, and you know, just from the coronavirus bill, the, the, that fact alone, now that is bank money because that's going to come out right from the government. And the, the government can can do that and issue checks. Obviously, in the stimulus of 2008, they issued whatever it was, $1,000 checks, $600 checks. The Treasury can do that. Um, so that fact tells you that the, the whole thing about the Fed adding to its balance sheet, no, that is not for Main Street. The Main Street part comes from the Treasury. It comes from the coronavirus bill. The problem in the coronavirus bill is that very little of that money comparatively – is getting to Main Street. Most of that money is getting to friends. It's the, it's the crony list, the short crony list. They're getting the, the vast heft of that money. So that's another indicator. But the real indicator in that bill is that you now see right out in the coronavirus bill the exchange stabilization fund. When the exchange stabilization fund was set up in 1935, I think, 1934 maybe, that was set up to basically when the gold – value changed from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. That was a huge arbitrage. The Treasury and the Exchange Stabilization Fund came in and pocketed the difference of $2 billion and away they went with the big slush fund. So this is the huge change is in it, it's reflected in the coronavirus bill. It is reflected in the Federal Reserve balance sheet. But the big change is on the ground. I, and I'm going to get into this in my next video. The St. Louis Federal Reserve came out with a paper. It was a note. It's not really a research paper, but it was a note. And it said, you can expect uh, unemployment to rise up to 32% in the second quarter. And now, to give by way of background, the Great Depression saw a, a unemployment rate of 25% at its, at its worst. At its darkest hour of the Great Depression, unemployment was 25%. And the Federal Reserve of St. Louis and James Bullard are saying, no, no. 32%. You're going to expect to lose something like, I think it was 47 million jobs. So that's, this is, a, this is what we are in right now is sort of to me like watching 9-11 in slow motion. It is not good. The tectonic is, is, is absolutely spot on way to describe it, James. I would say 9-11 doesn't even quite do justice to what's happening right now. It is orders of magnitude Agreed. larger than that. Agreed. Economically right. and every other way. It's it's incomprehensible, um, which is yes. why it's impossible to have a conversation like this trying to comprehend it as it is happening. But it is happening, and we have to get some sort right. of handle on this. Is this the final last taking of everything before on their way out the door of the bank, the mafiocracy, the banksters who have obviously overtaken the sovereign um, uh, coinage of the, of the, of the nation, or is this something else that's happening right now? It, it's, it's possibly the final flush down the toilet before the, the, the international banking cartel, those criminals, before they move on to something else. I don't know what that might be, but the fed pound padding its balance sheet the way it is, they're going to take, take a step back. The, the balance sheet, okay, so the liability side, from the Fed's point of view, the liability side is the reserves out there. The asset side is things like the mortgage-backed securities and the treasuries. The treasuries aren't so much of a problem because we were on the hook for those anyway. Okay, but other assets, 
that are that the Fed is taking on. They're paying out a dollar for an asset that's supposedly worth a dollar. Well, what happens when it turns out the asset is worth five cents? Who eats that 95 cent difference? Is it the privately owned Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the privately owned Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond? No, it's not. It's you, the taxpayer. And that's that's the great shuck and jive. It's like the privately owned Fed. It's privately owned when it comes to profits. But when it comes to things going south, yeah, you think they're going to pick up the tab? Wake up. So seeing the balance sheet go up like it is north of $6 trillion, possibly headed, probably headed north of $10 trillion when all is said and done, that's a problem because it's going to end up should all if everything goes to hell in a handbasket, which the Federal Reserve itself is telling you is going to happen. Not only are you left with your current debt, you're left with whatever debts have been added to the Federal Reserve balance sheet. So, yeah, I think I hate to speculate about that, but I, I, can the system absorb a shock like that? I don't know. I don't know, but the shock is coming. We're in the process of it. I think a lot of, you know, the, the nation right now is in shock because it doesn't know what's happened. And there's not a lot of clear thinking right now. There's a lot of, oh, the virus, the virus, the virus, the virus. Oh, my God, the virus is here. And it's a great cover for a lot of um, financial shenanigans, a lot of financial crimes on a massive scale. As you say, I mean, you make an important point. The question is, can the system even handle the shock that is the shock wave that we see coming? And the answer, if it is yes, it is it's difficult to imagine how the system can survive this. The question there thereby becomes, are we seeing a deliberate destruction of the monetary order as it exists? And if so, what does that portend for the future, obviously, the creation of a new system. Are we seeing the end of the dollar system that we've known before, or, or what? Are, what are we looking at? That that I don't know. I, I I wish I had a crystal ball. I don't. I I try. One of the difference I'm, the differences now with what I'm doing is, I started season two of Mafiocracy. Now, is that I'm tr trying to track stuff in real time. Um, previous stuff I've done has has been largely centered around the bailouts of 2008 because I think a lot of important lessons are contained in that episode that have been missed, in particular the lying by public officials and why they're lying, because people don't lie for no reason. They lie to hide stuff. And there's a lot of lying going on now. And the question is, what are they hiding? What are they hiding? I don't know. I'm trying to do that in real time. That's a new experience for me. There are clues along the way, like, well, the reserves are rocketing up and they aren't going to Main Street at all. But the long and short of it, I, I don't know the answer to your question. All I can tell you is that radical, meaning at the root of the financial system, radical changes are in motion right now. I do ask the impossible questions, so no no shame in not being able to provide the crystal ball answer. But uh, So let's ask a more manageable question. Um, looking at the various mechanisms that the Fed has enacted in the past month or two, um, essentially QE Unlimited, um, they're talking about reviving the, uh, the commercial paper funding facility that you mentioned um, in your work on the 2008 crisis, uh, the, the special purpose vehicles. Are there any other things that we haven't talked about that jump out at you as uh, obvious scams that are going on right now? Well, there's a couple. We're just from last week. Um, the Fed came out with its new balance sheet last Wednesday, actually releases it on Thursday. And what caught my eye in that new release is that within a week, you saw two facilities um, both pop up about 60 or 70 percent. Week over week, they popped up that much. One was the, uh, the money market mutual fund liquidity facility. Also, we saw in 2008, that's that's not a new one. That's It's been revised and retooled a little bit. And the other one is cent central bank liquidity swaps, which are really there to enable European central banks to turn around and bail out their big, too big to fail, the Deutsche Banks, the Credit Suisse, in those those big players over there. And those two, the money market mutual fund liquidity facility and the central bank liquidity swaps, especially the latter, really popped up. But you're right about the commercial paper funding facility. That's another one that's been revived from 2008, as you point out. So now when you see these things coming up again 10 years, 12 years later, it, you know, 2008 is starting to look like the JV team or the practice team. You know, and now we're going now they're now they're turning pro. 
And you make a good point, be precisely because we did not learn the lessons of 2008, they can be repeated uh, wholesale and with the same names, the same facilities, the same right. scam, and people won't even understand it as it's happening because they didn't right. understand it before. I would once if again... If the lies worked the first time, you're going to see them the second time, and we're seeing them a second time. Exactly right. right. Well, I, I would once again exhort people to rewatch the first season of Mafiocracy where you do cover such things. And it was, in fact, just in rewatching that that I, I saw, oh, commercial paper funding facility. Wait, didn't they just do that? And that's that's how I made that connection. So absolutely, if we don't ha understand what happened, there's no way we're going to have any understanding of what's going on right now, especially, as you say, as the transparency has actually shrank or increased. Uh, uh, the opacity has increased. You know what I mean? There is less the transparency now than went there was. Way higher. Right. Uh, can you speak to that? What what has happened in the past twelve years to make the the shadowy workings of the Federal Reserve even more shadowy? Well, there's a few things that happened. One was the market market accounting rule went down the drain. That didn't really pertain to the Federal Reserve so much. I think the big thing that got to the Fed was you remember back in two thousand and eight, or maybe maybe even two thousand seven, the Federal Reserve was sued by Bloomberg. There was a reporter named Mark Pittman who sued the Federal Reserve under at least the Board of Governors under the Freedom of Information Act. And the Fed lost that case. And at the same time that's going on, the Fed is in the process of losing, losing its FOIA case. There was also an audit from Congress instituted by Bernie Sanders and by Ron Paul. And the audit went through. And it was through the audit that we found out, well, who received the money from the commercial paper funding facility? Up until that audit, we didn't know. It was complete blackout. Nobody knew who got that money. Then as a result of that audit, I think in 2011, it was a GAO audit. The government accounting offices conducted that audit, did all the data spills out. And we find out that, oh, no, the commercial paper funding facility really wasn't for Main Street after all, was it? It was really for foreign banks, uh, banks you'd never heard of, Dexia, you know, Rabobank. And it was for domestic non-bank financial institutions, you know, so your General Electric and your, you know, Ford Motor, there was a few, well, there was quite a few in there. And, insur and in domestic insurance companies, AIG, of course, is in there. But I think that the experience of that, the Fed hates opacity. I mean, I read the Federal Reserve transcripts, the FOMC transcripts. Those aren't released until five years after the meeting. Nobody reads them. Everybody reads the minutes, which are released contemporaneously. The Fed is very anti-transparency. And so I think now... As a result of that audit, they're just clamping down and they're not, they're just tightening up and nobody knows what's going on. I mean, it's up to the Fed's discretion what to put in the minutes of the meetings. You know, the minutes could be completely vague and nobody can do anything. Have you ever seen anybody who's ever seen a lawsuit over the, the Fed minutes being hopelessly vague? I haven't. I don't know about that. So you got to wait five years for the transcript. And then, as I say, by then, the moment has come and gone, long gone, and nobody reads them. Almost nobody. Yeah, it, well, exactly right. And uh, I'll point people, for example, to your um, uh, your video on the trillion dollar devil and the details where you go through um, and dissect some of the, the testimony that was taking place in September 2008 from Paulson and Bernanke and these characters and contrasting it with what we then found out years later through uh, meeting minutes and other things that were released and notes from Scott, Scott Alvarez and others that showed, oh, this is what they were actually doing. And we know they were lying when they were testifying to Congress now. But now this is, right. ah, that's ancient history. I mean, uh. so- right. Nobody cares. To a certain extent, I mean, I, I, I want to I underline this point. Again, 2008 is important for us to understand so we understand what's happening. But you have experience of having dug up some of this information and exhumed some of the corpses that they tried to bury or the skeletons in the closet there. Um, what advice do you have for people who are interested in finding information about what's going on right now as it's happening? What sources of information should people be looking at? What should they be focusing on? Uh, number one, turn off your television. Don't turn it back on. Uh, don't read mainstream media. There's no need to read it. You can sort of you know, read alternative blogs, read, you know, corporatereport.com. Um, you know, naked capitalism is a good source. Um, Zero Hedge at one time was 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 decent. It has since become, in my opinion, a neoliberal tool. Um, the Wolf Wolf Street by Wolf Richter is a good one. WolfStreet.com. Uh, another good one is Pam Martin's site, WallStreetOnParade.com. So there's quite a few out there. If you just start with a, with a few, it'll snowball. But you have to start. 
you, you know, the mainstream is not going, they're just going to lie to you. So, to, you know, don't, don't engage in Stockholm syndrome and, and, and be become, you know, enamored of your captors. You got to move on and accept the fact these people are just lying through their teeth and you need to start seeking out alternative sources and just see where, just pull that thread and see where it takes you. That's my best advice. True. And in fact, all of those outlets that you specifically named are ones that I do look at because I do think they are valuable. Although uh, I would also say, yes, I mean, obviously do not trust what is coming out of the mainstream media, but be aware of what is being said through them because often propaganda, uh, understanding what propaganda is being propagated helps us to understand where they want, at least where they want the public to have their eyes on the ball so that we know where to look uh, elsewhere. Or as you uh, as you know, uh, you can see a, a Bill Dudley admitting that this entire thing is a lie because, uh, you know, actually well, that money doesn't mix. The, the reserve money isn't actually yeah. bank money. So we can get nuggets from that, but we have to choose them carefully. Um, and also, right. I, would I mean, say, I saw your video, your video the other day about the two minutes of hate and people banging the pots and pans for the healthcare workers. And in that video, you said, you know, I had a long period, 10, 15 years where I didn't watch any mainstream media. And now I'm back watching it. I, you know, I would caution you, James, dear James, please be careful. The propaganda is oh so insidious. Yes. <laughs> yes, I understand. Please be aware I'm aware of the dangers and I put my tinfoil hat on f- f- firmly before watching <laughs> so that I, I don't get affected. <laughs> but yes, it is. I, you're right. It is insidious. And, uh, and so we can't always understand the ways in which the propaganda is working its way in. So you're right about that caution. Um, but having said that, of course, another source that I'm going to direct people to is best evidence. And having said that, obviously people have stopped our conversation and watched every video that all 10 videos that you have released over the past five yeah, right. years. That's the thing. I've only done nine videos. I think I haven't done 10. Uh, really? Is it not? And that was over like six years. Uh, uh, no, it is 10. Who's blowtorching American jobs? Ben Bernanke's sovereign deception, fed audit shocker. They come from planet klepto, the veneer of justice in a kingdom of crime. All the plenary's men. We used to throw criminals off. New world order criminal bankers caused the, uh, Dot, dot, dot. American Revolution, right? The one trillion dollar devil in the details. Mummy, where did uh, where does money come from, and why is the Fed lying about coronavirus? So, again, wow, excellent. <laughs> I happen to have it up in front of me. Excellent, uh. excellent series of videos. I hope people will watch them. I hope people will be tuned now for episode two. When can we expect that? This week. I, I, I'll, I'll probably shoot it today. Um, I've, I've scripted it all out. The hardest thing with my videos is the scripting. I've planned these things out. I don't want to be wrong. Um, I have a very specific way that I like to present information. I like to go from source documents. So it's like, don't trust me. It, I, I'm not asking you to trust me. Look at these documents. Look at these statements from from people that I'm talking about. Um, and and that, that takes time to arrange it. But I'm going to shoot it today. It'll be out this week. For sure. Well, it absolutely shows. And I think if people resonate with the, the type of information I purve- uh, put, put forward here and the way that I do it, I think they will resonate with your presentation as well, because uh, certainly the source documentation is always important in your presentations. And I appreciate that so much. Yeah, you do. You do an outstanding job. I, I, I'm just blown away by how much content you're able to turn out with the with the quality that it is. I, I don't know how you do it. I you know, anyway. Well, before this I'm turns into a faster. mutual appreciation to, okay. society, <laughs> let's let's wrap up the conversation here. As I say, all the links to all of the things that we talked about today, including those vid- videos that we mentioned, will be in the show notes. So I hope people will uh, use that resource as 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 I can't even properly convey in a, in a conversation like this. One of the largest, probably the largest swindle of our entire lifetimes is taking place right now under people's noses. And most people aren't even thinking about it because they're too concerned about viruses and what have you. So please, please pay some attention to this issue. And we're going to leave this conversation here, but I'm sure we'll be talking again in the future. John, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, James. The Federal Reserve, the heart of the American banking system. For over 100 years, it has operated in the shadows, controlling America's money supply in total secrecy. So all that information is available uh, in our commercial paper program. And who got the money? 
hundreds and hundreds of banks, any bank or that has uh, access to the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve's discount. Can tell us who they are. No. Until now. 100 years ago, in 1913, the Fed was created. Fractional reserve banking. The legal authority to do it. Take over monetary policy. Are conducted by the Federal Reserve Banks. They are banks. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Century of Enslavement. The history of the Federal Reserve. Watch the documentary for free at corporatereport.com slash Federal Reserve and purchase a copy on DVD to help support The Corbett Report today.